My name is Corey Dade, and uh, thank you, Vince, for that introduction. And welcome to the first, uh, the, the scene setter here for today, the first uh, uh, session of the day, uh, understanding the ancestry of African Americans. And as Vince said, my name is Corey Dade. I'm a contributing editor at The Root, theroot.com. And uh, we're here to talk about, obviously, the ancestry of African Americans. And you know, as many of us know, the history and the ancestry of African Americans has been a difficult and sometimes tortured work in progress uh, since uh, slaves were brought here uh, to this land. Uh, slavery, the Middle Passage, and subsequent oppression uh, here in the United States severely limited uh, our ability to learn about and understand and even properly document our ancestry and our history here in the United States. And so now we have the advent of DNA testing. We have websites like Ancestry.com uh, and all these different methods by which more people are digging into their roots, so to speak, and they're finding uh, more about themselves and the complicated or the complex racial histories that they had and that, that they never thought exists. And this is not just for African Americans, of course, but any Americans. And uh, that research also holds you know, untold potential for science, for understanding health disparities, uh, but also their ethical concerns. So who better to discuss this than a historian, a geneticist, and an anthropologist? Uh, we're going to have a pretty informal discussion here, a fluid discussion. And from here, we're going to take questions from the audience. So without further ado, I'll introduce our panelists. And each of them will tell you a little bit about themselves and their work. Uh, first, we have. Uh, from my near side to the far side, uh, uh, Professor Sarah Tishkoff. She's uh, an associate professor in the departments of genetics and biology at the University of Pennsylvania. She is a geneticist. And we have uh, in the middle here Professor Linda Haywood. She's a professor of African, African American studies, <clears throat> excuse me, and history at Boston University. She's the historian. And we have the resident anthropologist. Uh, Professor Michael Blakey, who's at uh, the College of William and Mary, and he also is the director of the Institute for Historical Biology at the College of William and Mary. Please, a round of applause for them. <laughs> so we're going to start in the middle with our historian, uh, Professor Linda Haywood. Would you please uh, tell us a little about, you, about yourself and your work? Well, uh, well, I'm Linda Haywood, and um, maybe I should start in uh, about sort of how does a historian get involved in genetics and uh, you know anthropology? We we are scared of those things because we like dates and we like you know the past and and so on. And I think I, I should start by saying uh, when I taught at Howard University for 19 years, beginning in. 1984, I was told, oh, you said you're an economic historian of Africa? No, you're going to be teaching African diaspora. And I spent my 19 years teaching my core course, the African diaspora. And I really had to force myself to learn more comparative history and much more about the African American experience. I'd been an Africanist studying at Columbia University. But this was not only what was important. Issues of identity were also important because I had students who, you know, I would see a young man in the back of my class and uh, he'll be looking at me and not taking any notes. And, you know, after class I would say, you, look, young man, you should be taking notes. You know, we have midterm and final. And he says, you know, Dr. Haywood, this is the first time in my life that I've had a black professor. So I'm just looking at you, and my whole world is being changed, okay? So, so I, I knew that I, had to, I was having an impact. Just my being there, I was having an impact. I think this pushed me to learn more about my own identity and my own. So I would ask, send back to my Grenada, where I grew up. I was born in Trinidad, but grew up in Grenada. Send to my old aunt to say, what do you know about our background? I need to let the students know that I have an identity and situate that within the African diaspora. And I'll speak more of that later in the discussion. 
but also at Howard I got the, um, you know, opportunities to do a lot of things uh, in, in connection with the genetics and biology uh, and anthropology. This was the African burial ground to get to participate in that. And I thank Dr. Blakely for teaching me more about, in fact, you know, how to think outside the historical box and to look at skeletons and try to understand, you know, dentition and so on. I'm no expert, um, but I am very much part of that language. Uh, thirdly, uh, when I went to Boston University in 2003, I became involved in um, some of the um, media and other um, um, information that uh, Dr. Henry Louis Gates uh, became involved in. And then I really had to know about the African background because this was what it was important. If you're doing African American lives you, and you're trying to identify individual roots of African Americans, not only did I have to know the American story from the genealogists, I had to know the story of their biological background, their, their genetic background, so I had to begin reading things that I'd never read before, and I had to go and study much more uh, deeply the African background to the Atlantic slave trade, exactly which groups of slaves were coming out, where were they coming from, what are the ethnic groups, etc. So in a certain sense, these years of that experience have made me much more it, history is much more interesting. It's now not only personal, it's communal, it's national, it's identity, it's part of my being part of the African diaspora, and that's about the background I like to give. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Professor Tishkoff. Is, is that on? Yeah. I think it is. Okay, so I thought I'd just give you a little bit of background also about myself and what got me into this uh, area of um, research interest. So my background was actually in anthropology. That's what I started out as at UC Berkeley. And I was there at the time of Alan Wilson, if anybody has heard of him. And he really helped to found the field of molecular anthropology and got me really excited about that. So I wanted to use genetic methods to address questions about human origins, about where we come from. And so for that reason, I went on to get a PhD in human genetics. Now, at that time, I was working in a lab, Ken Kidd's lab at Yale, and um, he had a partner, Luca Cavalli-Sforza, at Stanford. And together, they had a uh, pretty amazing, diverse set of DNA samples from around the world. Now, in Africa, they had two groups. Okay, which everybody was using as the so-called representative African population whenever they did population genetics or evolutionary studies. Those groups happened to be two Central African pygmy populations. They couldn't be less representative, as it turns out. So as part of my thesis, what I wanted to do was look at the variation that existed amongst the different African populations. And to my surprise, I wasn't expecting this, I found so much more variation between any pair of African groups that I was looking at than I would see between Africans and, say, East Asians, for example. And I realized that we had greatly underrepresented the amount of variation in Africa. So after that, um, once I was a postdoc and then I went to South Africa to do research for a while, and decided that um, I wanted to return to also my anthropology roots and wanted to do field work in Africa, largely because nothing existed. There were almost no studies of human genetic variation in Africa. So um, part of my experience for the past uh, 15 years or so, myself, my students, and African collaborators have been doing field work throughout Africa, um, studying not only to collect blood samples, but looking at uh, phenotypic variation, so different traits, things like anthropometric traits or cardiovascular or metabolic that can also have disease implications. And so my focus has been really the history of Africa and the African people. And then from that, without that history, I feel like you can't know that much about, you can't really know about the history of the African diaspora. Until we get that settled a bit more in Africa, that's going to really inform us. Thank you, Professor. Professor Blakey. Well, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here and to uh, introduce myself as, as someone who began his career here. When I was 15, I worked uh, 
uh, upstairs uh, on 50 skeletons uh, analyzing the, the health of uh, two populations under, under Donald Ortner. And um, a lot has happened since. Um, in graduate school, uh, my, my fundamental uh, field is physical anthropology, human biology. But I never felt that was uh, enough. I, it's, it's not really meaningful to me just to look at human biology. I don't think I can understand it unless I know the cultural context, the social context, and the economic context of living populations. And so I worked on uh, issues of psychophysiological stress. The cultural and, again, social context of past populations. So, so I'm bio, uh, a bioarchaeologist, uh, biocultural, uh, biohistorical. And uh, the African Burial Ground project that I directed um, is interdisciplinary, involving historians and geneticists and archaeologists, while at the bioarchaeology, uh, physical anthropology, skeletal biology is at the core of it. And uh, the Institute for Historical Biology is one uh, in a place, a space, where we look at the interplay of biology, culture, and history. One of the, uh, for me, one of the best places to look at that interplay is in the history of biology itself. And so I was also back here working on the Herdlishka papers, studying how uh, genetics and biological anthropology had evolved, how evolutionary theory had evolved within society, its purposes, its, its influences. And um, it's clear to me that uh, as the sciences separated from their religious roots, as we, we, you know, we really go from uh, the monastery to the economy, uh, academy, as it were, um, they brought with them certain uh, ideas about knowledge that are uh, very much based in Christianity. So that natural science takes on a certain authority. Nature takes on an authority not unlike God. Natural scientists have in their hands a method for ascertaining absolute uh, uh, presumed objective truth. And all of that was, uh, you know, these are ideas, not necessarily facts. And all that was put in the hands of an ideology of eugenics, uh, of uh, race, whose purpose was to establish that the inequities that existed in society were actually natural inequalities, and that we just have to live with that. So this is a way of integrating those things. So when I look at genetics, and I'll talk a little bit about history too, I see a field that's had this this problem, and I look at a, a, a we are as a people um, in, enamored with genetics uh, in a way that uh, 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 turns us away from a strong critical scrutiny. We believe that DNA is who we are. Um, and yet, in genetics today, you know, there are there are the ideologues, and there are the skeptics. And on uh, genetic ancestry testing, the skeptics are telling us uh, that we have no evidence um, that these tests work. Um, you know, we can take um, uh, the work of Turi, who, you know, Often what happens is that it's, it's statistically more likely that an individual will, will be related to a population that has the highest percentage of that individual's, uh, of a particular gene or haplotype uh, found in that individual, or a series of them. And by that, Turi found that uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, is Somali. Uh, and but the, the same gene has fairly high frequencies, though not as high in other parts of the Mediterranean. And I think the press and I don't know, maybe the, the researchers clean that up a bit by making him, his ancestry, Middle Eastern, which is bit biblical, right? Um, and possible. But all of this is, is really very, very flexible. Um, Ely, um, uh, 
Jackson and Jackson found with respect to looking at Gullah Geechee uh, that uh, with the haplotypes that they were using, the, I'm sorry, Y chromosome, not the mtDNA that uh, Turi used, that 10% um, of uh, the of African Americans uh, might be able to, 10% uh, of the findings uh, would uh, allow one to show even a region in Africa associated with African Americans. That means 90% of the findings are an error. And a 90% error is not some information. That's something else. There is no study that tells whether what people are really looking for, which is their recent history, uh, according to the recent work of Royal, they want to know their recent history, last 200 years, 400 years. There is no study that tests with people who know that history the accuracy of using DNA on them. But we believe. Let me say, in uh, closing, uh, at the same time, you know, African Americans have always been faced with this problem, resulted from slavery's uh, attempt to destroy their humanity and their history and family lineages, have created a historical tradition, uh, historical institutions, as we know. Um, the Journal of Negro History, early on. And um, w we might have to settle for understanding that African Americans are, represent nearly all of Africa, much of Africa. And so our children have, are uniquely, if you will, have cultural characteristics that come from all of those places that can be claimed. But they can't understand them. They don't know names like Wolof or Igbo or Yoruba or Moors or Malagasy. They don't know what those words mean. Because there's still no African American, virtually no African American and African history in the public schools. Even in Washington, D.C., Montgomery County, throughout the state of Virginia. Um, and so this is where one finds one's history. Um, so the abuses of the past continue. And we need to think about what we might do about that. Thank you, for Professor, and thank you, panel. Um, so the first question, we want to set a baseline here. Um, this is all about understanding who we are, of course. Um, but as uh, our panel alluded to, or really said there was no illusion at all, actually. They're very specific. You know, there are challenges to understanding that history. And this is a question for each of you, and we'll, we'll start with Professor Tishkoff. You know, so what are the challenges to understanding the ancestry, and what are the, where are the holes, and what are the consequences? What have been historically the consequences of not being able to understand that history? Okay, so as the geneticist here, I'll talk about some of the genetic, I think, challenges. And I think one of the biggest ones, and this is one where I've tried to fill a bit of a gap, is just simply not having the data. And so a lot of the issues I think that arose, particularly with some of the early genetic ancestry testing, those that were looking at mitochondrial DNA, just to, since we're starting the day off, I should say that's um, the, a, a genome that's within the mitochondria of the cell and that's passed on through the maternal lineage. So mom will pass it on to her son and to her daughter, but then it gets passed on the next generation just through the mom, okay? So you can trace it back to a common ancestor. And then you can also look at the Y chromosome, which is passed on from father to son every generation. And then we can look at the rest of the nuclear genome, which we get from both parents. Now the difference is that most of the mitochondria and most of the Y chromosome is not recombining every generation. You can trace them back to actually a single common ancestor. But the rest of the genome is being shuffled every generation. But you have to remember every piece has its own evolutionary history. It's telling you a little different piece of the puzzle. And when you trace back mitochondrial DNA or Y chromosome, you're tracing one ancestor out of hundreds. So if you look just in the past few centuries, all of us, think of us, 
about us. We have our mom and dad. They have their parents. They have their parents. Go back a few hundred years, you have hundreds of ancestors. Go back a thousand, and you have thousands of ancestors. But those tests that are often relying on mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome, they're looking at one of those. And then they're going to look at a database. And so what they tell you is going to depend on that database. And until we do a really broad survey of Africa, you can get a very biased result. Secondly, these tests are based often on what is the prevalence of this lineage in a particular region. It's very hard to trace back to any particular ethnic group in Africa. Now, I'll give you a couple of exceptions. I study a lot of the hunter-gatherer groups, like the San click-speaking populations in southern Africa, the so-called pygmies in central Africa, some hunter-gatherers in East Africa, some of them have very unique lineages. I could probably tell you if you have those lineages that you trace back there. But otherwise, it's very challenging. So nowadays, uh, what we're doing more and more is starting to look at the rest of the nuclear genome. And it's particularly challenging to look at. And we use a lot of statistics and probabilistic methodology um, to do that. So I would say, remind me again, the original question was the challenges, right? The challenges so, and what the consequences have been of that. Yeah, so the challenges are much of what we do, our field, people often don't realize it is about probability. Um, we use statistics and probability, and it's not exact, as you said. And what I try to do, what I find most exciting is when I look at the history of Africa, for example, is trying to integrate that data with the archeological data or the historical data or the linguistic data. And so we have to keep in mind that we still have a long ways to go to develop proper statistical methods to be able to interpret this data. And then the data is rapidly changing. So now we can sequence entire genomes, getting much more challenging. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Professor. Professor Haywood. Well, as the historian, I, um, I know that all of Africa, we do not know the history of various African groups. But during the Atlantic slave trade, we have a very good idea of which parts of Africa were involved in the trade. In fact, sometimes we have very precise information on exactly which groups of Africans were you know, captured and brought out. For instance, the first group of Africans who came to North America, to Virginia, we know that they came from Angola. We even know the war that was fought, the conditions under which that war, those wars were fought, the actual areas and the extent to which these areas were integrated into the Portuguese colony, which the Portuguese were the ones who brought those, or captured and brought those Africans from Africa. In addition, we also have some idea of the linguistic and historical events in Africa, we as Africanists had to study the Bantu migration, and there's a lot of new evidence about the Bantu migration. In fact, just this, uh, just this week, I read another article on the edge of Bantu expansion, mitochondria DNA, Y chromosome, and lactase persistent genetic variations in southwestern Angola. And what they are finding out is that some groups you know, males with a white chromosome seem to be more stable. The women were being brought in. As a historian who have done Central Africa, that precise area, the Ovimbundu and Southern people, Nanyeke, et cetera, I can tell you that the Ovimbundu during the 19th century were bringing into that area people from the Luvali and Eastern Angolan area. They were bringing in those people from the South. So I could explain, and they were bringing in women because they were using these women as wives and as slaves, right? So we, if, we ha if we work closely with the historian, we, the historian can, in fact, provide some of that precision that what we're saying now, the geneticists might say, uh, or the you know, ethnographers and, and biologists might say, well, we don't know. We know the history. Let me give you one other example, three different um, DNA companies did my mitochondrial DNA. They all turned up the same set of populations in Africa that I had this mitochondrial DNA match with, my closest, the Fulani. 
from Guinea-Bissau. My closest match was Guinea-Bissau, but there are Fulanis that go from the Futajalon area in the Senegambi area all the way to northern Nigeria where they are known as Ful, Ful, uh, Fulani in, in, in the Senegambi area is Fulbe, in northern Nigeria, Fulani. So if you have this, not only that, I could tell you precisely what wars that were being fought, jihadi wars that were being fought in that Futajalon area that would have in fact led to the capture of a young woman who the French took to Grenada. I can tell you that. So I am not as skeptical of those DNA. Now I have, plus the fact, as I am reading more, and I said, oh, lactate, um, persistence and lactate deficient. Yesterday I had this thing. You know, my family, I'm black. I'm supposed to have lactate deficiency. I can't drink milk. I drink milk every morning for my whole life. <laughs> Okay, for my whole life, I'm still drinking milk, okay? Then they had these things. Oh, you know, as a black person, and a doctor told me that. You cannot have, in fact, you know, osteo, because this is really Asian and European. Guess what? When I was in my 30s, I was diagnosed with, um, uh, with, with uh, you know, this, this uh, you know, osteoporosis. And I have, I'm taking ta I have to take tablets to strengthen my bones. Where did this come from? Maybe some sort of, I have European in me too, 17%. So I'm saying that every one of you could in fact begin to do your own research and you can take these, put them together, the family history, you put together the history, the African or the European history, and you put together those little things, and you begin to get a sense that you fit somewhere. That's where my identity fits. So no um, skeptic could tell me, well, you're not related to the full bay said, yes, I carry that marker. I don't know which, which woman it is, but I know I carry one marker because we cannot see everything, as she said. All the things, or the only thing that you can possibly say, mitochondrial DNA, you inherited from your female ancestors going all the way back. That's what I know is a certainty. So I'm not a skeptical. So when I assert to people my identity, I said, yes. Somewhere in Futa Jalan, my ancestor was captured and brought to Grenada. And I think we should be doing much more of that, joining with the historians to try to figure out and, and narrow the possibilities. There'll always be skeptics. They'll always, you're not, you are not going to get everything complete, but you're going to have some more certainty than just tell me you come from the bush of Africa. I did not. My ancestors <laughs> did not come from any bush in Africa. <laughs> Africans had history. Well, thank you. <laughs> Let me, can I say? Yeah, we have, we have shots fired. Shots that, fired already. This is good. This is good. The historian score is one. Okay. We're going we're gonna to hear from Professor Blakey, but we're going to bring it back because I know Professor Tishkoff wants to, wants to weigh in. Let me say that it is by the study of history that you understand Africans have history, not by the study of DNA. Oh, yes. And that history is fascinating and should be available to all of our children. Um, you know, I'm interested in that although the SOLs require what looks like really extensive West African history, that that be taught in Virginia schools. None of my high-performing William and Mary students knows anything, because somewhere between that and the teacher in the classroom, it doesn't happen. So I've enjoyed that history. I know that Africans have history. There are a lot of folks who don't, but it's about whether they've been taught history or not. They also say, if you use the same method, you'll always get the same result. Compare the same haplotype type against the same comparative database, and you'll always get the same result. So if we were to use this uh, STR haplotype that was used on a Y chromosome for, for Thomas Jefferson, he will always come back Somali. <laughs> <laughs> and, but if you apply some historical limits, as I imagine are done, and say, well, he's, let's leave out the, uh, the Africans, he will always come back somewhere in the Middle East. And if Jefferson were alive today, he would also probably uh, disregard the skeptics because that sounds right to me. You know? Now I know my relationship to my ancestors. I've heard and talking around the country uh, from uh, a couple of people who've sent in uh, asked for two genetic uh, uh, ancestry tests and gotten 
completely different results. I know with the African burial ground, and some could accuse us of starting this business of ancestry tests because we were working uh, in the, on skeletal populations with regard to this, and I remember uh, uh, Jeff Donaldson, the artist, and uh, uh, Congressman Hilliard said, well, you know, if you could do this with living people, you know, that would be really powerful. I think somebody said, you'd make a lot of money. <laughs> we said, well, we, we don't think that it works like that. We don't think we can do that. But let's keep open the conversation. Um, and uh, when uh, our first test was done, we did it with individual skeletons that also had African cultural traits, waist beads, filed teeth, and a significant number of these came back as Europeans and African and uh, Native Americans. Hmm. We had to think about, well, how could that be? Uh, then our geneticists, uh, one of uh, Kittles and George, you know, uh, tweaked their pipette skills and took three. That was with one haplotype. The three L1, L2, and L3 haplotypes ran those uh, for 40 individuals, and they all came up West African. Then we look to you, and I think, well, and in your history, you may, you may emphasize Central Africa more <laughs> no, than I, I would. No, I do West Africa. No, I do West Africa, too. I do West Africa. <laughs> Who says, but there should be Central Africans in here, yes. in uh, New York in this period. So we wonder, where are they? Maybe, is this the West African part of the cemetery? Yeah. What we realized is that these comparative databases were accrued right. by the history of genetics research right, that had right. been done, yeah. and none of the geneticists had an interest in, had, had asked the question, what is the origins of African Americans? Mm -hmm. So when they go to Central Africa, like Luca Cavalli Sforza, mm -hmm. he is interested in what? Pygmies. Pygmies. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Not the complex societies that are involved in international trade. Yeah. They're interested in evolution. Again, it gets back to this thing. So when you compare a database that might have mm. DNA related to them to this, these, the, the African burial ground, to that database, nobody from mm. Central Africa who could be related is at home to welcome them. <laughs> and so we said, okay, as Fatima Jackson began to do, we need to expand mm. the um, comparative database. Still, the problem of probability is there. That same mm. problem I said with respect to Jefferson mm -hmm. is the is an, and the problem of probability that can make the data lie mm. is always there, going to be there. And the way to find out, I think, ultimately, and I can't emphasize this more too much, the only test of whether these uh, work to answer the questions that people actually have about their last couple hundred years, 400 years of ancestry is to take populations, maybe they're Wolof who uh, have griots who know their history, maybe they're royal families in Europe or Asia who know 200, 300 years of history, their history, and test the same thing you use on random African Americans on them and see uh, how reliable it is. That is simple, that is science, mm -hmm. it is skeptical, and it has never been done. Thank you, Professor. Professor Tishkoff. <laughs> So I just want to say that I am not at all surprised that you have full B ancestry. <laughs> this is not a surprise to me. And the reason why, and I'll say from the genetic perspective, what we found is that um, I was involved in a very large study, I think the largest to date of African genetic variation. Mm -hmm. And um, then we also looked at African American populations and we found a significant, not huge amount, but significant amount of full B ancestry in the African American community. So that, to me, doesn't entirely surprise me. Now, it was funny what you said about lactose tolerance, <laughs> because as a matter of fact, that's one of the things my lab has studied. We found new mutations that um, regulate lactose tolerance in Africans, mm -hmm. mainly in East Africa. Mm -hmm. So this is a trait that's yeah. adaptive, yeah. and it rose to high frequency in populations who practice pastoralism Pastoral, yes. mm -hmm. and daring. Now, the Fulani, mm -hmm. or Fulbi, practice pastoralism, yeah. right? Yes. And we're actually studying that group because it turns out that they can drink milk and they are lactose tolerant. Now, interestingly, in that group, they do not have the East African variant. They have the European variant. Yes. 
Now, they probably have other variants that we yes. still have yet right. to identify. So I was just saying yeah. that I'm not surprised, but a lot of people, as you said, make these generalizations. Yes. Nobody, no, people from West Africa can't drink yes. milk. Right. And this is a great example where you have to look within Africa. There's yes. a lot of different mm -hmm. cultures and a lot of mm -hmm. different uh, genetic variation. Mm -hmm. And then also touching on what you were saying, Dr. Blakey, is that um, you're absolutely right. Much of what we interpret is dependent on the database. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the issues that I'm concerned about, maybe some others will talk about this later today, has to do with the data being made publicly available. Mm -hmm. So as a, si a research scientist, one who's also getting money from NIH and NSF, I'm obligated, and I also believe for moral reasons, I make my data publicly available, okay? Now, that does mean that the companies can then grab it and <laughs> use it to make some money. <laughs> um, oh, you like that. <laughs> okay. Um, I've always tried to think of ways that we could put some of that money back to the people who contributed, but as it turns out, it's quite complex. Um, but so we made this publicly available. Now, many of the companies aren't going to do that. This is their prior, their, what do you call it? The, um, this is what their uh, prioritary, prioritary <laughs> dairy uh, uh, database that they have. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't share that data, mm -hmm. it's going to be very hard for the different, that's why different companies are coming to different right. conclusions. So just wanted to make that comment. Can I have one sec sure. to uh, just, uh, the thing is, Angola is one of the least, you know, attested countries in Africa. Um, Cameroon and the uh, areas around there are one of the, is one of the highly t most tested. So when, Ang when people have certain markers, LC, you know, mitochondrial, and they just tell them, oh, you're from the Cameroon. We know that no slaves were coming from the Cameroon and the, uh, in fact, Cameroon entered the slave trade after America uh, started, you know, um, uh, exporting, you know, uh, stopped the, the import of slaves. And I'm not saying that a few, ca you know, people from that area would not have come. But the bulk of Americans, Afro-American ancestors, did not come from what is today the Cameroon. We got to know that history. And I, I absolutely agree. History, African history should be taught at every level as European history is. And I am too. I, you know, my students the first time, oh my gosh, these words, Wolof, oh. I, I said, look, you learn about Asafasan, uh, you know, I can't even pronounce it, all these different words. You're gonna have to, you're gonna have to learn it. It's like a language you're learning. You learn German. There are some words in German that give you three, three pauses to say. So don't tell me African words are too difficult. I think there are some biases, some biases about African, and you, we got to get that, and you cannot get that starting at the college level and specialize. Right, right now, we have a decreasing number of students taking African history at college, I'm telling you. And forget it, it's very prominent among people of African descent. They don't take the course. I am telling you, I've taught for all these years, and I can't understand why it is that this reticence to, to sort of enter that field, you have to expand your mind if you are going to know what you are and really be comfortable with yourself. It's interesting you say that, Professor. Uh, I remember when I was in college, uh, we, I, I was in a African-American history class, and it was majority, the majority of the class, it was one of those huge lecture halls, majority of the students there were African-American, or they were certainly uh, black from the diaspora. Um, and they were the ones not taking notes often. Um, there was a conceit among the black kids that they knew this history. Um, so they were there to get an easy A or B. Um, and that, you know, the white kids who were there, they're the ones who had to work, they're the ones who had to study, so let them study. Um, it took failing one, maybe one test for them to figure out that this is real. Um, <laughs> So I, I, I'd like to, and to that point, I'd like you all to, to weigh in on this. You know, there is, you know, there's this notion that America is, it's a false notion, of course, is in a post-racial society. Uh, so there's that. But even beyond that, uh, discussing race, not so much racism, but discussing race, racial differences, racial diversity has become snake-bitten. Not just discussing racial oppression, but race in general. There's this notion, I don't see race, which is, you personally just idiotic. 
we should see race, we should see cultural variations, and understand them and appreciate them. The idea is not to be colorblind, the idea is to take all the tableau in and work it into you. So as you all have done your research, can you all talk about uh, whether or not you have seen sort of this societal pushback? You know, coming out of uh, the Civil Rights Movement, for example, there was this sort of explosion of uh, African Americans entering the workforce, African Americans entering academia, and even the history of African Americans starting to become, uh, and the, the, the scientific research of African Americans starting to gradually become a little bit more prominent. Uh, but can you all talk about any societal pressures or resistance or fatigue you all are seeing to your work? And let's start with Professor Tishkoff, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there seems to be a continued um, interest, I think, in learning about human evolutionary history, African ancestry, African American ancestry. So I can't. I don't think there's a fatigue yet, mm -hmm. so far um, in that area. Um, but remind me, what was the first part of your question again? Well, just looking at, uh, are you oh, all race. seeing? You asked any... about the concept, though, of race, right? And whether. Yeah. So I, that's actually, I think, important because. Yeah. Um, whether that resistance to discuss race in America. Well, influences. and that comes up a lot, actually, in a lot of the classes that I teach. So I teach both at the undergraduate level, in University of Pennsylvania, and I have taught at the medical school level. And in the medical school course, we try our darn best. They really resist it at like every level, but we're trying to teach them about genetic variation and why they should know about population genetics. And one of the things I talk about is race. And a lot of people have been afraid to even mention it, you know, because there's either it might offend somebody and you're gonna get some negative reaction and so on, or people will say race doesn't exist. But the reality is most of the doctors out there are putting in their charts, so they're asking you, right? When you go to the doctor's office, how many of you have been asked, what is your race? <laughs> they're putting it down there, okay? They're taking that into consideration. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I tried to talk to them about is, first of all, it's very problematic because race has, by definition, uh, both biological and cultural annotations. There has been this horrible intertwining through history. It's also been used often in a very abusive way so that it's now very difficult to talk about that. And what I explained to them is what we really care more about perhaps is ancestry. But what you want to know, knowledge about ancestry, and if you don't have any knowledge about ancestry, self-identified race can be informative at times as a physician or perhaps as a biomedical researcher. There's no doubt about it because there are going to be some diseases that might be more prevalent in certain populations, there might be different risk factors, and so on. I don't think we can simply ignore it, okay? At the same time, you have to be careful of, I call it racial profiling by doctors or anybody else, <laughs> because what they forget is, I think you were saying, like you're lactose tolerant, yeah, right? right? Many of the doctors would just assume not. And again, let's say somebody came into the doctor's office and they're suffering from anemia. Okay, and the doctor might say, and, you know, they self-identify as African-American. So the doctor immediately thinks, ah, oh, you, you must have sickle cell trait or, you know, some G6PD or something that's very common in Africa. Now, had that doctor asked that person about their ancestry going back maybe a couple generations or whatever, they might have said, well, actually, I have a grandparent who's from Italy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, ah, maybe they have thalassemia. <laughs> you know, maybe that's what I should have been looking at. So they can misdiagnose you know, things if they're ignoring that. And ultimately, I think as Carlos Bustamante is gonna talk about and some others, the ultimate goal is to be able to say at any region of the genome what your ancestry is, or maybe at any particular gene, because that's gonna be much more informative in terms of um, making medical diagnoses and maybe for proper treatment and things like that. Yeah. We certainly are not in any post-racial anything. Because, uh, because what I see is that there's a burden of race in America. And look, I am, even though I'm from the Caribbean, yes, we have race there. But as I tell people, okay, my race, so I saw these Brits, but what I was getting in my Caribbean history is about the Caribs and Arabs and Araks and so on. And, you know, we were not directly burdened with the discrimination in constant. And you come to America, I go to my church, and I'm not gonna mention anywhere. And you know, 
people will say, oh, you're Episcopalian. They don't expect to see me there. My great-grandmother was an Episcopalian. So obviously I'm going to be Episcopalian and, and, unless I go and carry, follow my aunt, who is now a strict Seventh-day Adventist. She doesn't do anything on a Saturday. What I'm saying is that, <laughs> you know, what I'm saying is that you should, we shouldn't categorize people. And we, we have to break through that. And the only way we can break through that is to start with the children at the very young age, to make all populations. America is not made up of just Europeans, Native American and various kinds of Europeans. You know, there was a time when the Irish was black. I hope you know that. There's a time that I could tell you, I look in the document, in the 1623, 1625, you know, muster rolls and on those, some of those deeds, and guess what I'm seeing? Six Irishmen, five Negroes. So there's two categories. These were just people who were not English. The Irish were not English in those days. We become, you know, Americans. And the white, white Europe, uh, Southern Europeans and the others who were marginal to the core English have become American. But I think we ought to, we ought to accept that we have to always work towards you know, the post-racial, and in fact, always be conscious that we're doing it. So in my class, my students who come at the end of the class, I wanted them to tell me, as this young man last semester, I was so last year, I was so happy. He's, he's a young, a white uh, student, Dr. Hayward. Why did not I learn this African-American history in elementary and high school? He said, this is American history. This experience of what African-Americans went through is in fact part of American history so I could understand myself and my place. That to me is a validation of the teaching, the core, you know, redoing the way in which we approach the teaching of, um, uh, of history and in fact make Amer uh, Afro-American history part of, you know, the legitimate on the same level as, you know, um, um, American and European history. And you know, you, you say something, Professor, go ahead, I want to, I was going to well, throw to you on this something. this is maybe yeah. reinforcing, uh, uh, but to also relate this conversation clearly to some other things we've been talking about, there are no racially private genes. There are no genes that are exclusive to a race. There are no ethnically private genes, and there are no regionally private genes. We all share our genes in different proportions. But a misunderstanding about that uh, is part of what would seem to be the, the power of the idea of genetic uh, ancestry in people's minds that this is a gene that goes only with, you know, the Fulani. Um, but it is also a way of searching the ancestry, but one has to do that, you know, in a very qualified, careful manner. Very often the ancestries we're looking at are thousands of years old, have nothing to do with uh, the slave trade, uh, you know, in the, in the immediate sense of it. Um, racism certainly exists. Race exists as a cultural construct. Mm -hmm. Racism, there are much evidence that it is thriving uh, in the inequities that are increasing mm -hmm. among income groups and so-called, you know, culturally defined racial groups. And so research that focuses on that would help us understand that, you know, things like hypertension, uh, diabetes, mm -hmm and other chronic diseases that are increasing or changing over time are doing that because the society is increasing and changing over time. That they vary by these groups does not indicate the genetic basis of these diseases. There is no evidence of the genetic basis for African-American hypertension, but any physician will tell you, of course, it's true. It's not. It's been disproven several times. Um, takes our attention away from what might be seen as evidence of racism, the stresses and the uh, poor adaptation to them with poor foods and obesity and so forth that contribute to hypertension and diabetes represent the oppression of those people. Uh, instead, it becomes, you know, something genetic. So, um, and then I, I do not, I do want to just uh, add one more example of how this sort of feeding frenzy can occur when, you know, when you combine um, 
Let, let me also follow up on the, the issue of uh, history in schools. The absence of an African and African American history in schools may be the most uh, profound expression of the continuance of the production of white supremacy in this country. It is direct, it is blatant, and uh, what are we doing about it? When I was in high school, in Coolidge High School up the street here, uh, we organized in the late 60s and got out of there in 71 to have black studies. We had uh, African music, we had African American literature, we had a number of things. Key Swahili, I took two semesters, Key Swahili, uh, African history. When my group left, three years later, was removed. I went up there not long ago and find they don't have, these African American students with an African American principal do not have African American history. That's not just accidental. That is an institutional, that is institutional racism. Professor Tishkoff. Yeah, so I'm going to move away from that last part, but just one comment from a genetic perspective about you were talking about that there aren't any population specific or population private genetic variants. And I would say that's not entirely true nowadays with the more sophisticated genetic um, technology and particularly sequencing. And what we're finding is that you are absolutely correct that most of the genetic variation we see is shared amongst. We all have a, co a recent, fairly recent common ancestor in Africa within the past, I don't know, 50 to 100,000 years. And all modern humans share an ancestor 200,000 years ago in, in Africa. And we know that most of the genetic diversity is within populations relative to between. So there's no doubt about it. But as we're getting into sequencing technology, for example, we're starting, we are starting to find variants that are private to either ethnic groups, self-identified ethnic groups, but then again, at the level of the individual, right? Each of us is unique at some level. That's what makes us us, right? But we are starting to find some. And I think that as, um, and another example is lactose tolerance. So when you have natural selection acting in different regions of Africa or different regions of the world, that can shift variants to perhaps very high frequency in one region and very low or absent in another. So these genetic variants we find for lactose tolerance in East Africa, they are only in East Africa or in places where there have been migrations, such as into Southern Africa. Very, very specific. So I think there, that because of natural selection, you can get some population-specific variants, and with today's sequencing technology, we're finding more and more. And I would argue that, th uh, hopefully there'll be discussion later today, I think the sequencing technology may enable us to do a little bit more fine-scale resolution of trying to determine ancestry. Although, as I think some of you alluded to, it may be somewhat uh, dissatisfying, because what is going to happen, and we've already have a hint of this, is that you may be able to, right now, when we look at um, West Africa and we look at people who speak Niger Kordofanian languages, for example, they are genetically very similar as a whole. When you start looking at a more fine scale level, we can start seeing some subtle differences. But there's been a lot of migration in West Africa, right? That's part of the, the issue within the last few hundred years. But let's say we could even identify some variants that are maybe not specific to an ethnic group, but maybe a region, uh, possibly. And then if we were to try to look at African-American genomes and look at any particular region of the genome, what are we going to find? We're going to find that at this particular region, they can trace back to that region or ethnicity in Africa. And at this region, they can trace to another. And at this reason, region, they're going to trace to another. I mean, that's what, is that going to be satisfying? That's what I want to know. Well, <laughs> Are I people think, going to find that yeah. satisfying? And am I telling you anything you didn't already know, <laughs> right? I the, think what, what uh, some of us are concerned about, and I, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Blakely, that in fact that these variants in the genetic coding is then subsumed under the issue of race. And that, in fact, racial identifying, you know, blacks as having, that's what I think the concern is. That if you go, because if you do not educate the public, they just, we just fall back on what we know, the categories we know. 
and right. the categories we you know black, white, a Asiatic, all of these, which have been abused in the past and which were socially constructed. So Ameri we have to. So be Americans have become more comfortable. Right going with what they're familiar with, which yes. are these racial constructs. Right, right. And it reminds me of an article I found that you were in, Professor Haywood, um, uh, in the LA Times. Uh, 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 the writer who's, who's white talks about their um, uh, family origins. And uh, I think the, the last name was Mozingo? Mozingo, Mozingo. Yeah. And, um, and so uh, he was able to trace, there was one person in the family who knew the origin of that name you can imagine which continent it came from, um, but he kept it quiet. He would not, he published a regular newsletter to his family about their family history, their origins, etc. And some elders in their family asked him to keep that information quiet. Uh, they had daughters they wanted to marry off and they didn't want to get shamed by that information and ruin their chances of, of a good marriage. Uh, they had, uh, Right. Um, and uh, they had been told that name was Italian. They had been told that name was anything other than African. Mozingo. <laughs> All right? Can't be African. Um, and so uh, not only did this writer uh, go and find the history and realize that you know, they did descend from Africa, at least that, that part of their family, but they were, he was able to find that that name actually descended from an African prince, but more specifically, from a slave. Um, and it was one thing for them to realize that they had African ancestry, uh, and even identifiable African an ancestry. It was another thing for this white family to come to grips with the fact that they had descended from slaves, African slaves here in America. And, you know, so the, 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 and of course, uh, Professor Haywood is quoted in there explaining, you know, the historical origin of Mazingo and what part of the, con uh, the, 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 uh, the continent they're from. And, and the fact that just, just by virtue of the fact that that name came through the Middle Passage to, to America uh, signified that this person was literate and knew enough to keep their name. And the fact that they're literate implied even more than that, uh, suggested even more of that based on history. So it, it got to how uh, moored people are, especially whites, to separating their own lineage from non-whites here in America. And that seems to have ruinous consequences, not only just for our understanding of our own historical background, but even when we talk about understanding our genetic, our genetic coding and even the, the the health implications of that. Uh, can someone jump in on that, please? Well, I can tell you that the new article, and I just came upon it a few days ago, even though it was published in 2011, Melungeons, a Multi-Ethnic Population, by Robert, uh, Roberta Estes, and he is, in fact, one of those Melungeons. These, I'm sure you have heard about the Melungeon. You know, uh, they, they were, we believe, uh, you know, in a certain part of Virginia where some of these Angolans, some of those early Angolans, as racial um, coding got into place with slavery not being, with uh, uh, women, slave women and men not being allowed to, to uh, marry whites, which they had for a certain time, you know, domestic uh, indentured servants, a white indentured servant marrying a, a, a black, um, a, a, you know, slave. Um, it took place, not a lot, but took place. That's where you find in the, you know, um, uh, um, Obama's uh, maternal ancestry, you know, has that root. In any case, what we find is that when the, the, the sort of, as American history become, became more racialized, these Melungeons had to make decisions about, you know, where they would lie in the, you know, in the social ordering and some of them decided to become white, and that's where right. his family ends up. But some of the Mozingos are, in fact, uh, you know, non-white, blacks, and they end up in the, po in the black population. So there's a fascinating set of uh, movement now on the part of young, you know, um, descendants of these families to sort of try to find where did my, in this case, where did my name come from? You know, well, and, and the family secrets, 
And that's why it can be very unnerving. And One, for, for those I, who don't know what Professor Haywood is talking about with Obama, his, his maternal ancestry has been traced to uh, the person who's regarded, and this is the white ancestry, of course, the white American ancestry, has been traced to the person who's been identified uh, by some records as the very first African slave in America, uh, dating back to the 1600s, before actual you know, slavery as we knew it took over the colonies and certainly the South. Um, but I, I was going to say, if, you know, the, the dynamic of passing, anyone who's African American knows the story of passing. I have it in my family. Uh, generations ago, people who are light enough, they passed. That creates a whole other dynamic. You know, so if you are uh, seeking medical care, um, if you're looking at you know, your own history, if, if you're trying to get treated for something, they assume that you're Caucasian, they assume that you're white, and as you put it, Professor Tishkoff, the medical care changes, uh, perhaps for the worse. I'd like to s shift now uh, a, a little bit. Uh, Dr. Ba Blakey sort of alluded to this earlier about sort of uh, you know, the, popular, the popularity of us trying to find out more about our ancestry, ancestry.com, you name it, um, and that a lot of this work that this panel is talking about is work that goes back thousands of years, or that's the, at least the, the effort. But many of us here in America, especially if you're African American, want to know about our history 300 years back. Um, and can we talk about sort of the popularity of this type of testing testing and you know the ethical issues and the accuracy issues what are the problems there potentially well, let me if I could uh, get right to that but I do want to say with regard to the blockage between uh, the, uh, against our tax dollars being used to teach all Americans um, the history of Africa and African America uh, I I have a project called Remembering Slavery, Resistance, and Freedom. It's a partnership of William and Mary, uh, Virginia Foundation for the Humanities, and the Virginia General Assembly. And we've, talk, we've talked to people all over the state. And we've, you know, uh, coming to a, a, an understanding that there is a contradiction between the narrative that whites cling to of the, uh, uh, of the virtue of their ancestry, of the sort of valor of what is framed as American history, and African American and African history. Um, that African American history, the history of, and of slavery, if, and you can read <laughs> Jefferson and he will tell you that these were the people who built, built the country in the colonial and early uh, antebellum period. Um, that they were abused, that they prevailed with their humanity despite that, and so forth. So, but if you write that out, you have a very clean, valorous, white history in which it appears that white people are really creating everything, and sometimes they, they can decide to give other people a part of the national uh, wealth. So that barrier that contradiction has somehow to be broken because it is uh, clearly standing in the way of the truth. Um, with regard to the, I would just say one example, because we're here to kind of stimulate discussion, I guess. So I've talked about the, the power, the awesome power of this almost godliness of natural historical explanations, and i.e., therefore, DNA. And you, if you add with that celebrity, marketing, business, and the television program, and the imprimatur of uh, even a, even an a, 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 and the, an a, a English professor from an elite university. You get what the um, geneticist uh, Jeff Harrison at Oxford used to call, although I'm using his words a little differently, used to call big magic and high sorcery. That's how he described statistics. Big magic and high sorcery. So that Oprah Winfrey, 
Some of you know this story. Working in South Africa can be told authoritatively that she, her background is Zulu. Yes, but you know we corrected that. She's Pele. We did correct that on film. Is Zulu. Can obtain that result from the DNA testing. And she didn't do a test. No, she just asserted that she was Zulu. She did not do a test for Zulu. Well, I, I was reading something, actually I will tell you online, that said she did do a test. Okay. But the the audience is saying uh, okay. she did do a test, the results have not come back yet. So the she's, she did she's the, preemptively asserting no, no, her no, Zulu no. heritage? That, um, Oprah Winfrey's test, or, um, finding Oprah's roots. John Thornton and I were the historians who were sent the information, genealogy, the DNA results, and then we had to frame a context in which the, the, the closest match that she had for the region, and that's how we identified the group today called Pele in Liberia as the most possible likelihood of her maternal ancestry, and this is what Oprah received from Skip. So I don't know if you've seen the, film, the, the video, but please see it. Finding Oprah's Roots and the earlier video, African American Lives. And John Thornton and I, and other historians as well, but we were sent all the, the that is why we had to l try to be more familiar with all your scientific as historians. So we did the best we could in terms of the historical, the history of the slave trade, the regions that were supplying slaves, a certain region, the, the historical names of people that you know, linked to the present day names of ethnic groups today. So that's why we gave Skip a list of 50 possible ethnic names that had there. We gave the names in the slave trade period and the regions in Africa where they are today. So I think we are, if, the, if we can have more, um, you know, organized um, collaboration, setting up an institute and so for this. That's where you would have much more precision and much more possibilities. Secondly, I want to take this opportunity to say, I think that we should think seriously about looking at the DNA roots. I'm not going to dismiss it. What I'm saying is we can use that to give stories, historicize Africa presence here. That's what would in fact allow you know, a much better comfort level with the African background. And we have stories that we can give. We have historical developments that were taking place at any one time when a wool of company, when you find these ancestries, various ancestries, then you have to say, let's look at for an African story that we can contextualize this. So if you go to the Smithsonian African Life, you will see the story of the Mayflower from the Gold Coast, where John Thornton and I helped to develop that particular story. You can have other stories, but you have to have the historian who is trained in Africa with African history. Because sometimes when we have it from the American side, people are afraid to do African history. You have a lot of distortions. Thank you, Professor. Well, if we can pause for just a second, we're running short on time. If you have questions, we're going to try to get some in. Please line up at either mic on either aisle. Okay, let's come on now. Let's not wait because we don't have much time. Come on and start asking the questions or line up and I'll start taking your questions and we'll go back to Professor Blakey. Go ahead. You were, you well, were I was saying that talking about apparently genetics. I'm in error about that. There was a misunder uh, misinformed about the Oprah Winfrey story. Um, Nonetheless, you, uh, you know, the same problems, you know, and I give Jefferson is, is, is my example of these same problems that, that persist. You, whatever those societies that are possibly related to Oprah Winfrey or anyone else are possibly related, but uh, you can't know for sure. And, you know, there's also the, so, and, and with your, you know, tests, you know, I don't think you would think that your background is just full of. No, because I know my, my father's background. I, I mean, say, I sent it to my brother. I said, I want to know. So I know that somewhere in Dahomey, some guy 
gave that Y chromosome to my father's family. So you just have to do, you, can, you are only given a limited series of, you cannot know every ancestor. Why don't take the one that has the nearest possibility of accuracy and then run with it and do what you can? I'm not a fool, babe. But I might go back in Futa Jalan and say, give me my little village here and my cattle. <laughs> I want my cattle. What's you your, know? What's your that's, African that's equivalent of 40 acres and a mule? All right, let, why don't we pause and take a question. This gentleman here, please. Can you hear me? Are we working? Yes. All right. My name's Heath Carlock. I'm a visiting scholar at the University of Pennsylvania College of Arts and Science. I want to, I think everyone would say this has been very engaging, utterly remarkable. You all have allowed us to correct some things with our own beliefs, especially myself. Um, that said, the subject of teaching African American history in schools, there's an education technology company right here in the district who last month, right before the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, launched their platform. They're called EverFi. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with them. EverFi launched the 306 platform. If you go to everfi.com, I happened to attend that product launching, and they had there the first black mayor of Tuskegee, Alabama. He spoke, and there were other things discussed. Um, 306 is symbolic of the Lorraine Motel number that Dr. King was shot in front of. Um, and it's also symbolic of, during the Harlem Renaissance, there was a space 306, uh, I believe that was the address for where some uh, heady people met uh, in, the, in the black renaissance movement there in Harlem. So I just wanted to throw that out there that this is an effort uh, launched by EverFi and it's something to get behind, someone you should be able to contact and some technology you can push as well. So I wanted to put, put that out. Thank there. you, not so much a question, more like a plug, that's okay. All right, we have a question on this side, please. I have, I have another um, just comment. I wanted to read something, a quote from Oprah Winfrey that opens up an article in Chance, a magazine of the American Statistical Association. The article is called, Is Oprah Zulu? Um, sampling and Seeming Certainty in DNA Ancestry Testing. I always wondered what it would be like if it turned out I am a South African because I feel so at home here. Do you know that I am actually one? I went in search of my roots and had my DNA tested, and I am a Zulu. All right. Thank you. We're looking for a question somewhere in here, somewhere. <laughs> well, um, obviously, um, you know, that uh, is uh, not new to me, but I thought we corrected it. Thanks, Professor. <laughs> Ma'am, your Fatima question. Jackson, um, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and Howard University. And I, sp I think it's wonderful that you've got the panel. These are all my friends. Um, I think in terms of setting the stage for understanding ancestry of African Americans, we have to understand that African Americans are an amalgamation of African peoples with modest gene flow from North Atlantic Europeans and Iberian Europeans and Native American peoples. That means there's going to be complexity in our heritage. And the techniques that are developing can only help us better refine. But the techniques, the genetic techniques, have to be combined with anthropological knowledge, with historical knowledge. And ultimately, the people who we're discussing have a say in their identity. And this is very important because identity is more than just the science. It's also the culture. It's also the sociocultural constructs. So I don't have a question for you, but I do want to say <laughs> one more thing in terms of Oprah's uh, uh, Pele ancestry. The problem is, is that these mitochondrial DNA uh, haplotypes are 80,000 years old. This is before any of the ethnic groups mm -hmm. that we're talking about ever existed. Yeah. So there's a, there's a mismatch yeah. between the, the timeline of the genetics mm -hmm. and the ethnicity of the yeah. groups. In fact, Oprah's DNA, which I've seen, matches a number of groups, about 30 different groups wow. in Africa. So we choose which one we want. Yes. Thank you. 
but but we we know that we know that no South Africans came to America as slaves. So we, it's not just choosing anyone. We then eliminate those that are in fact outsiders, outliers. Right. Thanks, Professor. Question over here. Yes, my name is Emma Ward, and I represent the 102,000 seniors that we have here in Washington, D.C. What I would like to know is if you all have ever targeted our group of seniors who have a wealth of knowledge, and because we are retired and 60 and above, it doesn't mean that we're still not here ready to do things. We have very few groups who contact us to try to get us involved. So I'm here to suggest that you get us involved in some of the things that we can help you with. When I go and I go to the schools and I talk to the st students about Harriet Tubman, I want to weep when they tell, ask me, is she still living? <laughs> I mean, this is real. And you ask them about the states in the United States, they don't know it. I say, how can you become president? if you don't know history, you have to know history. So one of the things that we are suggesting again, let us have one minute, 60 seconds in it. That's all we need. I can ask you in one minute, who am I? And I can tie it in, we can tie it in with a black history person, or we can tie it in with our history from Washington DC up into Canada. So I'm suggesting to you, get in touch with our DC office on aging here in every state we have, well, we have 44 states now where we have one representative who represent the seniors and these are the things that we need to let them know. We need to talk to them, they need to talk to us. Okay? Thank you, and the oral tradition has always been important in the black experience. Let's take this question over here, ma'am. Hello? <laughs> Hi. Yes, I have a, um, I'm the president of the Southern California Genealogical Association, which has numerous interest groups including African American and Chinese. Um, many of the issues you're talking about of trying to make connections back to a homeland are present in both of these groups. And we need resources. So is there some way that I can get some resources that um, could be available that would help us um, I'm with the group that runs the DNA interest group as well. And so I, I'm hearing this, we're money. getting more data, get et cetera. Money. So um, any ideas from the panel about grants? Uh, any no, kind I'm of not funding looking for money. I'm looking for books or something people can read so okay. I can get yeah. better educated, so I can help Okay, I thought you meant people. financial resources <laughs> to continue to work. Okay. Yeah. Well, certainly, I think. What I find is that high schools and, and lower levels of uh, education really, uh, the textbooks are like 20 years behind right. what and you can stumps. find in college. So we need more interface, and I could suggest that you know we develop a common uh, bibliography, and I could get a, a, a list of uh, books together for that, the type of things on the Melangian, that's one. Secondly, I think young people here need to begin to take advantage of the technology that you have on your cell phones and so on. There are a lot of apps now available. In fact, one that in, uh, my, my own daughter just finished an app with a British company, you know, Timeline of the Civil War. And when she was uh, began in, her involvement as the head, one of the producers, in fact, the core, um, uh, thema the core producer for the actual uh, materials that are there, she called me and I said, make sure that in that you have the African-American experience in the Civil War. So in that app, and I could give you the, type, the name of the app, it's just five something, but what is important is that she has a whole section on African-American, and it's wonderful to kind of compare day to day in every state what the African-American pres African presence was during the Civil War. We need more of that. So we need people who are in technology, who are in the history, to begin combining a little company, that company you talk about, let's go, let's get together and form this thing where you have the, the, the sort of 
the, 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 the technology that young people are now, they're not going to read a lot of history books, but they're right. definitely going to get involved in the apps and, and learn that so. So those stories that I'm telling you about could be dramatized in a way of, you know, through the app. So that's the suggestion I have. And especially for people with funding to look into creating apps of African American, African, and European history because the Europeans, Chinese, they were coming in all at the same time. So it's like the immigrant project on tech. That's what it has Thank to you. do. America is made up of immigration immigrants. Thanks, Professor. We have a question over here. Yes, good morning to those on the panel and good morning to those in the audience. My name is Eugenia Pinckney and I'm a student with Trinity University here in Washington, D.C. My question is directly towards Dr. Touchoff, if I'm not, hopefully I'm pronouncing your name correctly. But I noticed something that you had stated earlier, and I just wanted to know if you could elaborate a little bit more about it. You mentioned that you're doing research and study from a standpoint of the medical side of DNA and tracing our history back directly or precisely to find out exactly where we come from. I want to know do you, um, your web. Mm, I would like to know your web address where I could find more information about it. And also, too, um, how is that really? How's that going at this point as far as actually find accuracy and precision as far as finding out as that African history as far as exactly where we come from? I know you had talked about the Y chromosome that you've already gone to go back from 100 years, from 1,000 years. Is that, how is that really um, being accomplished right now? Where's the setting of that taking Thank place? Thank you. Professor? Yes, so it's an ongoing effort by many different research groups. And of course, it takes a lot of funding, a lot of money. Nowadays, our funding is in serious trouble, <laughs> thanks to sequestration and other things like that. Hopefully, we'll be able to continue. But um, so as I was saying, one, my group and a few others are going to Africa to study the people there. Because if we don't actually go to Africa, there's no resources. There's nothing. Many of the people I, that I work with or study, they've never been included in any studies before. They're being completely left out. And that also has negative consequences for them in terms of better biomedical health care and treatment and things like that. The other interesting thing is I find that in Africa, when I do my research, they care more about their ancestry. Mm -hmm. They love knowing about their ancestry. They have mm -hmm. no problems with that. They want to hear about it. They say, wow, that reminds me that my grandparents said, yeah, you know, our, these two ethnic groups, they used to intermarry and so on. Um, and in terms of, I think you were asking, what, what's sort of the state of what we know? It's how, rephrase again, you wanted to know? Well, you said you've been doing this research for about 19 years, is that correct? Um, going down to South Africa, finding information regarding um, the Y chromosome as far as finding out genetic um, information as far as relating to the medical field, as far as helping or assisting us in I guess you... Okay, I'm having a little hard time hearing, but do you mean res you want to know resources where yes. you can find out those? Two, yeah, two things. She wanted to know, since you make your information, your okay. data publicly available, where she could find that, but also okay. basically what your progress is in being able to look at uh, the genetic coding that you're finding in Africa and uh, attach it to it. health disparities, disease, mm -hmm. you name it, the medical okay. implications of it. So first of all, in terms of the data that we're making publicly available, this is a huge problem in terms of um, the layperson being able to access it. Even other scientists have a hard time <laughs> being able to do this. This is a major problem across our field. Each one of our labs, there's many people here, we all have labs, we're studying something in Africa, we're depositing it, maybe in a public database, maybe in our own database. But it's very hard to get them joined together and you even either have to do it yourself at your lab. It's very time consuming. There are very few public databases. But one thing that NIH has done, one of the missions of NIH is to make sure that there are publicly available databases. So I deposit all of my data in something called dbSNP is one of them. And another one is called dbGap. Anyone with the knowledge could go out there, but it's not super accessible to the layperson. It would okay. be very, very challenging. And I get people writing to me all the time saying, can you help me? Can you tell me more about my ancestry? And I, I have to point them to some company, and not one in particular. I just say, well, there's a lot out there. And you know, just be cautious about how you interpret this is usually what I say. But there, there is a lack of that. I wish we had more of that. And in terms of progress being made to look at um, disease, 
Um, my own group, for example, is very interested in trying to understand genetic and environmental risk factors for diabetes, metabolic disorder, um, cardiovascular disease, for example. And if you can compare, say, people who are living an indigenous lifestyle in Africa to those who are living a westernized lifestyle here in the U.S. or even in urban areas in Africa, we may be able to learn something to distinguish genetic and environmental factors. Because when I study some of these groups that are living very remote regions, living an indigenous lifestyle, I do not see diabetes. I see almost no obesity. I see very little cardiovascular disease. Then these people move into the city, even in Africa, they move into an urban area, and boom, it's just going up, <laughs> you know, shooting through the roof, the rate of these diseases. Mm -hmm. So there are efforts by NIH and others, and hopefully continued funding so that we can be studying that. Okay. Let well, let me, me, I want to just... Yeah, Professor Blakey, and then we'll, I think we have room for one last question over here after Professor Say, Blakey. Thank you. That, you know, um, very often, um, I remember when there were issues about Native Americans wanting to have the right to determine the disposition of their dead, and the 18,000 Native American skeletons here at the Smithsonian. Colleagues at the Smithsonian uh, uh, said, well, you know, we can learn so much that would help them. We can learn about diabetes and so forth. And, you know, I said, there are no methods in skeletal biology and paleopathology to get at uh, any understanding of the etiology of diabetes, of the genetics of diabetes. Very often, um, we see our, as I don't know if I suggest this about the Human Genome Project, you know, the, the, it, it did a great job of dis describing the human genome, which needs to be done to take further steps. But the promise that people thought it had was, would be to give us the answer to the causes of all kinds of disease and, of, and, and, and social problems, which it has not done. So, you know, I think uh, this is kind of, uh, you know, Professor Tishkoff, you're, you're, you're suggesting also by what you're saying that the, the cause of diabetes may not have anything to do with genetics. It has to do with what you're calling Western lifestyle, and the differences in rates of diabetes have to do with one's condition within that uh, industrial capitalist Western society. Or the so, interaction of the genes and the Well, of course, it has, if all biology is, a, if all biology is, is, is made by genes, of course there's an interaction. But the differences may have nothing to do with difference, uh, interaction, interacting with variation in genes. So I think it's, it's important to show the efficacy of these uh, ideas about uh, health, as it is to show the efficacy of the uh, ability to show recent uh, ancestry, not 80,000-year-old, not 1,000-year-old ancestry, but 500-year-old ancestry by sampling all those people. Now, I think sampling all those people is important in, it's sort of circular in, in, in working that out. But there is a point now where some tests can be made and the feasibility of doing that can be established uh, better uh, so that we know whether, you know, these this research is going to serve the purpose of health, is going to serve the purpose of African-American ancestry or evolutionary interests that geneticists have that have nothing to do with that. And then finally, I would say there was the woman who spoke earlier. I just hope that uh, genealogists do not give up their archival research, that they do not give up collecting oral histories, as I've seen them do. You know, one of my, sort of my, the thing that stirs my blood about the African lives thing I was beginning to talk about with Oprah Winfrey is that a number of these celebrities throw out yes. precious yes. family histories because someone has given them the word of God <laughs> in a genetic assay that, as I have emphasized, we have no evidence of the validity of and the evidence we do have shows that we are often misled. Uh, Thank you, Professor. If, if Professor Haywood, if we can pause. <laughs> want to give as much opportunity for questions, and this is the final one we have okay. here. So you may get a chance to yes. score another point. I hope I Hang on. <laughs> Whoa. Okay, hi. Can you hear me? I'm Bonnie Schrack, and um, I want to thank Ms. Haywood, first of all, Dr. Haywood, for the suggestion of an institute where we could get 
a better combination of historical and genetic genealogy research. That's a great idea, especially as applied to African American yeah. history. Um, I have to say with Dr. Blakey that you know I have a lot of differences, and that when you're talking about quotes such as saying that Jefferson's uh, matches would be in Somalia, that um, sounds like a, probably a very old publication, perhaps. There's been incredible uh, progress in the resolution of our knowledge of the Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA. And I just want to cite a paper here, Increased Resolution of Y Chromosome Haplogroup T Defines Relationships Among Populations of the Near East, Europe, and Africa by Mendez et al. Um, that just came out in 2011. And a quote um, from that, just very, very brief, says that um, most likely Thomas Jefferson based on his matches in their extensive data, it supports the hypothesis that this belongs to an ancient rare European Y chromosome lineage rather than ones that recently migrated from the Near East. Right. Yeah. So that's state of the art science. Yes. Uh -huh. The data were there Thank in 2007. You. The problem is that the same problems that exist within genetics existed within craniometry. That uh, these are there's overlap between all these populations. Yes. It's always a matter of probability. And, um, and there are a number of other problems that I've talked about. You know, oh. I've been doing the science for a long time. There are, we hear, with regard to the phenomenal capacity of genetics, promises for 100 years. And they are often not kept, and they are not kept in this case. Demonstrate that a person who knows 200 years of his family history can be typed accurately. That's science. Okay. It has not been done. Okay, just let me add, uh, and thank you for your, for your okay, comments. We are working on One that thing effect. from the former yeah. um, um, questioner uh, mentioned about you know, the availability of these uh, databases. I, I read uh, a few weeks ago that, in fact, the NIH, I think on the case of Henrietta Lacks, and the, the, you know, that they, in fact, have now, the family is now part of, in fact, the decision making to, in fact, make her cells, you know, lack cells all over. And in fact, the, the book that came out on Henrietta Lacks, I actually use in my class. And it's the, for those young students, reading a journalist very well done and the way in which the family you know, is engaged and, and what they found with the, about the family, it's just fantastic. Yeah, it's very That's helpful, how you yeah. bring the DNA and those family stories. And you contrast it, my students are going to contrast that with the autobiography of Ralph Bunch, mm -hmm. a much more mm -hmm. clearer, you know, kind of an academic. It's fascinating. There's a lot that we can do to bring these stories. And there is now, you know, things available from both the science and the humanities from the journalists. Many of those are journalists doing their biographies. That's all. Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to do the journalist thing and be bossy. We have to end this. Professor Tishkoff, Professor Blakely, Blakey, Professor Haywood, thank you so much for a good start to this day. A round of applause for everyone. And we're going to wrap it up here. Of course, they'll be here all day, so if you want to buttonhole them in the corner. I won't be there to defend them.